Okay, um, I'd say let's start. Um, mm -hmm. Well, we have Neil Killick here, thanks for coming, no uh, on his famous no estimates topic <laughs> on alternatives to agile estimation. Um, yeah, so welcome, Neil, thank and you your stage. Yeah, thank you. Um, um, yeah, thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk to you guys about this. Very excited to be somewhere like REA, which I hear is a really, really awesome place to work. You guys have got great uh, improvement, learning and improvement culture here and what have you. So I'm kind of a bit nervous that a lot of what I'm going to say, you're going to be kind of like, yeah, well, duh. Like, this, this is kind of what we do anyway. Um, but hopefully you're going to get something out of, out of what I want to talk about. Um, so essentially, I guess it's pretty much been the last couple of years now, I've been uh, debating this topic with uh, certain people um, on Twitter and, and uh, on blog posts and what have you around the whole topic of how we use estimates in software, and particularly the sort of upfront estimation we do. Um, and so just some, before I launch into presentation, just want to, just some questions I've written up here, um, which hopefully, you know, after this presentation finishes and, and as you sort of go about your daily work, things you could perhaps ponder um, when you're either making an estimate or you're asking someone to give an estimate um, on some work they that they're about to undertake. So, First question is, um, you know, if we're doing upfront estimates, can we actually welcome and embrace change? Um, secondly, are we are we estimating or guessing? So, estimating has to involve some kind of knowledge or experience, otherwise it's just a just a guess. Do we actually have that at the beginning of, of uh, projects? Um, do the estimates become deadlines, or are they actually treated as what they are, which is an estimate? And um, so if they are treated as deadlines, do they actually influence the way we work rather than sort of trying to uh, deliver the best outcome for our customers and stakeholders? Are we actually being influenced by the, the original estimate we made? Um, does backlog, backlog item size actually matter? Um, and are we being driven by cost or are we being driven by value? Um, so those are, sort of, I guess, some questions that Typically, I, I sort of ask people, and, and I'm, I ponder myself around, around this kind of stuff. So, um, so essentially, when I'm debating this topic, it always boils back, back down to this one question, which is, yeah, that's all great, but how do I know what I'm going to get and when? Um, and it's a, obviously a perfectly reasonable question, given you know you're spending some money on something, you want to know what you know what the outcome is going to be. Um, but I just I just wonder if it, it's also a bit of a dangerous question um, in, in that it sort of sets us off on, on a footing of setting very quite specific expectations um, around you know when something's going to be delivered, how much it's going to cost, what it's actually going to look like. And what, what can typically happen is that this conversation actually ends up um, becoming a, a sort of predefined set of scope or a product backlog. Um, which we then end up um, sort of just incrementing through rather than trying to look at building a, a, a sort of early solution and then iterating over it. So, and I guess the reason we, we want to actually provide this estimate is that people you know, want predictability about what, what, what they're going to get. But I, 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 again, I really question that you can get predictability by making predictions. It's, it's kind of a bit ironic because you know you, you don't really know what's going to happen, especially in the context of software, which, as you know, is extremely variable and um, it's a creative issue. It's, it's not like a sort of manufacturing process where you can break things down into repeatable kind of widgets. Um, it's extremely variable. So, in order to get predictability, I would sort of I would sort of say that it's actually the, the delivery of software frequently and delivery of value frequently, which gives us predictability rather than the predictions that we make before we've actually done anything. Um, so like I say, making predictions isn't, isn't the same as predictability. And you know, to give you an example of so the London Underground, you know, typically you know, we want to know when, what time our next train is, for example, but if if, you actually, if, if the trains actually come every two or three minutes, then suddenly that question becomes irrelevant. So the predictability comes from the fact that you're, the, the trains are delivering frequently, rather than the, rather than the fact that we're, um, 
we, we sort of know when the train is coming. We don't need, the question becomes irrelevant. So it's almost like, you know, estimates for their own sake are fine, but what, you know, if we actually want to build the right thing for our customers and stakeholders and, and you know, build the most valuable thing, we actually want to make the question irrelevant rather than sort of worry about, you know, worry about the estimates. And I, and I find that if you actually work in this way and sort of use the, you know, agile principles and lean principles to actually deliver this work, that the sort of the typical questions that you get in, in, in around estimates just go away. You know, instead of asking, you know, when am I going to get this and what am I going to get, we start asking, well, what should we do next? Because we've got the predictability that we're actually delivering delivering stuff frequently. Um, so, one, one of the, I guess one of the key points I always make around estimation is that what it does, it, it sets like an, an arbitrary constraint around what we're doing. So. The real constraint is, you know, how much money have we actually got to spend? What is our budget? Um, or it could be um, a specific time frame. So, you know, if we're building a, a, a Wimbledon application, obviously the, we've got a hard deadline of the beginning of the Wimbledon tournament, right? So that's a real constraint. And working with those is, is, what, is what brings out creativity, I, I think, in knowledge workers. So. Um, you know, if you, if you think about when we're, you know, if, if you've only got $20 to feed your family in a week, you know, let's say you normally spend $100 feeding your family and all of a sudden you've only got $20, you don't just say, well, I'm not going to feed my family this week. You, you, you come up with creative ideas around how you're actually going to use that $20. Um, and in, in the same way with software, if we're actually, if we've actually got real constraints around what we're doing and we know about those, then we can actually get together and go, okay, look, you know, we've, we've got... You know, $100,000, the business wants us to come up with a solution to this particular problem. Um, let's get our heads together and actually solve that problem. And, and that's what I feel, you know, as knowledge workers, that's why we sort of do this job, is that, you know, we like to create things and solve problems. And I sometimes feel like we're kind of spoon-fed the problem and the solution, and we end up just sort of get going through the motions and delivering something that's already predetermined. And, as, as soon as you know, we come up with some new idea and say, well, hang on, why don't we throw away what we've done and, and do something else? It's kind of politically not acceptable, and you sort of have to keep on that, you know, that original, uh, that original decision you made. It's, it's, it's kind of like you're held to it, and uh, it's very difficult to change it. Um, another, what I believe is a classic mistake that companies make, and, and, and again, it um, really hampers the predictability that I'm talking about is that we tear down high performing teams. So, you know, we sort of, we, we have this kind of project mindset where everything has a sort of start date and a, and a sort of finite end. Um, whereas actually, if you think about it, software initiatives don't really have an end, they're, they're, they're ongoing. So to try and sort of, you know, put a kind of false arbitrary boundary around that actually is, is, is problematic in its own right. And, and, and the fact that we actually tear down project teams um, which have spent, you know, perhaps months together building up, you know, really, really good culture and, and dynamic and high capability. And then we say, right, this project's over, we're going to split you guys up. And then we've got, got some new initiative we want to work on and we bring a new team together, which has to go through the whole ramp up process, which can take, you know, a couple of months. Or we might, but the, the, the dynamic might be wrong right from the outset. So. It's, I think we make the mistake of just thinking that people are, are sort of interchangeable in teams, just based on their skills, rather than actually looking at the, the, the individuals and the way that those individuals connect in a team. Um, so, you know, I, I'm a firm believer in it. Again, if you keep high-performing teams together, then you're actually, again, the whole problem with sort of estimating up front goes away because the team knows knows the domain they're working in, they know how to work, how to work together, how to get the best results, they're effective, so you know, you don't have that whole issue of having to, you know, build the team up, build the team knowledge up. So um, I I think that would solve a lot of problems if companies thought more about keeping sort of fixed teams together. Cross functional teams of course, teams that can that are able to solve any sort of given problem that you give them. Um, yeah, so that's it. And Another thing, I suppose, is the, the you know the topic of technical excellence. So um, obviously, it's not enough to just have great teams working together. There are certain you know certain ways of working that that you know we're sort of 
finding a, a more effective ways of delivering software. You know, clean code, elegant design, <coughs> ability to easily change direction, to so make our, our code base agile, we need to actually you know, follow some certain principles around, around the way we code. So um, things like TDD, continuous in integration, um, continuous delivery, all of these kind of these kind of things all help us to, you know, create a code base that, that enables us to actually be agile with a small A to, to sort of adapt to, to what we're building um, and, and not sort of build up. Because a lot, a lot of the times what happens in sort of agile adoptions is that teams start off and they start delivering value early and, and everyone's happy, um, happy at this fact. And then as the code base gets bigger and bigger, it gets really, well, it gets a lot harder to actually sort of change the direction of, of, of what we're doing and actually extend the design to, to, to you know, deliver what the product owner wants. So, um, and then of course people start getting frustrated because all of a sudden, you know, this team that could, you know, churn out 10 features a week can only do five features and then three features because the code base is just getting un uh, unmanageable. So I think this is a really key thing that we have to make sure that we've got that sort of technical leadership across our teams as well so that we're doing the, doing the right things. Um, and of course, deliver early and often. Like a lot of this is just sort of basic agile principles, but a lot of it sort of gets swept under the carpet, in, in my opinion. Um, you know, let's 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 get a, a solution out there, and then start iterating over that and, and and actually delivering. So, you know, make we need to reduce that gap between producing something and and, and producing the next iteration of it, so that we can actually fail. Um, with, with what we've delivered and, and, and there's no problem doing that. If we don't have that sort of safe, that safety of failure, then again, we're gonna be tied to a particular solution that will make failure catastrophic. Whereas if we've just spent two weeks on something and we realize it's the wrong direction, or it's not a big deal, we can, we can pivot and, and, and you know, uh, move on to a different way of looking at it. Um, I think another key thing is, um, so it's, it's not just enough to just kind of, um, uh, to, you know, deliver more quickly and with a higher quality. It's actually, um, in order to get that predictability that we're looking for, flow is really, really important. So by that I mean delivering fully working tested features um, in, in, a, in, in a sort of, um, you know, every, every few days. Say, say every three days, uh, a groomed story is actually delivered end to end. If we don't do that and we sort of end up, you know, Getting development, uh, the development done, but then you know we have like a queue of testing, and it, it actually takes you know three or four weeks to actually deliver a couple of features. Then you know we might get a big batch of features delivered after a couple of weeks. <laughs> so kind of from a velocity point of view, it looks okay, but but actually it makes it more more difficult to um, actually be predictable. Um, whereas if we're saying you know look every every two or three days typically we we deliver a story, um, it, it, it actually you know, the product owner point of view and the stakeholders point of view, they kind of, you know, they're going to be less inclined to sort of panic and be asking questions about, well, when's this going to get done? When's this going to get done? They know they're going to see the next thing come out in the next few days. So flow is a really important thing to think about and some of the principles I'm going to talk about in a little while um, help us with that. Um, uh, so yeah, this is, um, I've mentioned it previously, but it, to me it's a classic mistake that, that <coughs> Agile in, in inverted commas teams make, is that we come up with a product backlog um, for the, you know, an initial product backlog of, of user stories, say, and then we, we sort of split them up into iterations, so say two week time boxes, and then we just work through those uh, through the product backlog, and then we, yeah, yes, we might sort of move things up the list and drop things down, but essentially we're just incrementing through the product backlog, and that's um, that's actually uh, avoiding a, a really key agile principle of, of actually iterating. So, actually coming up with a, a solution to the problem, a holistic solution to the problem, and, um, in a short time frame, and then iterating over that whole solution. Rather than rather than coming up with a sort of idea or solution and then just building bit by bit towards that solution, the danger with that is that if you've got this, if the solution is the wrong solution, you could spend you know weeks or months basically doing the wrong thing. Whereas if you can actually solve the problem you're given 
um, in, a, in, a, in a sort of you know early, early way, which is actually it might be really rough and ready, but it actually solves the problem in some way, and then we can actually iterate over the quality of that thing once we're sure that we're doing the right thing. So you know, there's a famous uh, um, illustration of that of, of, of um, delivering the Mona Lisa. Um, you know, if we just increment and we're just kind of you know building her up bit by bit, and you're not actually getting a holistic view of what the what the final thing's going to be. Whereas in, in, in this in this example, you know, you do a really really rough and ready. You know, you know you know that the problem to be solved is that you want you know a picture of a lady with an enig enigmatic smile. Um, you start off with a really uh, rough version of that, and then you say, well, you know, well, now we sort of know holistically what we're doing. You know, actually, it'd be really good to sort of focus in more on the on the quality of the, of the facial features to make you know really accentuate that fact that we're sort of trying to show the enigmatic smile, and then and then sort of uh, building up bit by bit the quality as we get more and more confident in what we're doing and the domain we're working in, um, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So. <coughs> That is a really crucial thing, um, and it's uh, it also sort of ties in with sort of, you know lean startup approach, um, but in, in the you know building some, building the sort of smallest uh, minimum thing that you can that's going to solve actually solve the problem, and then a decide if it's actually you're actually working on the right thing, and then if you are, then start iterating over that rather than just sort of coming up with a list of features and then incrementing over those, and even you know I've even seen it to the point where. You know, you build a, a particular feature, and then we just start iterating over that one feature, and we don't even know if that feature is uh, a useful thing that customers are going to want. And we start making, you know, we say, "Oh, that's not good enough quality," and we start, you know, spending a lot of time on this one feature and ignoring the actual, the overall problem that we're solving. So, this one is a really key, uh, key one. And again, the, the questions of uh, when, when am I going to get, you know, the, the solution to my problem? Well, if you give the, the solution really, really early. Um, might be rough and ready, but you know what? It does the job, and then you can talk about how you're going to how you're going to uh, pivot that. Um, so the product backlog. When we when we do these upfront estimates, like in a sort of agile inception, and we come up with a product backlog, and then we estimate the whole thing, that to me is again just setting off on the wrong wrong foot. Because if we are truly iterating over a solution, then the product backlog is just a list of options of things that we might do. It's not actually a list of stuff we are going to do. Otherwise, we might as well just write a, a business requirement specification. You know, like if we're actually if we're actually saying, look, this is everything we're going to do, then um, yeah, it's it's not really an, an agile product backlog. You know, the idea of a product backlog is that we, you know, it gives us a sort of holistic idea of where we want to head for the product, but the, the you know the whole thing can change at any given given time. We have to be looking at the, the whole picture. And I find that when, when teams actually realise this, it's really, really empowering. It, you know, it, you can start off and, and feel really bogged down with this massive backlog of, of stuff. You know, I've seen product backlogs that have got hundreds of things on them, and, it, and it's, it's, it's it, aside from being like an admin overhead, it, it, it just, um, it's just not, not a workable thing. And, and it, it becomes very mechanistic what you're building, rather than if you've got a nice small backlog which has the key sort of themes and, and, and you know, the problem that you're actually trying to solve on it and it really focuses and hones in on that then you know it's actually really empowering that's where the creativity comes because you can say you know let, let's actually do the right thing and and solve this problem the right way for our customers rather than just let's just do what we said we were going to do at the beginning um, the other thing is is um, I guess estimating, you know, for example, with story points or whatever sort of technique you're using, puts a real emphasis on, on the cost rather than the value. Um, and I think that's uh, a shame, and I think it's also quite dangerous and can be costly as well. Again, ironically, because you're focusing on cost, actually that can end up being more costly than if you, if you focus on value. So, um, so iterative funding, so or drip funding, um, rather than saying, you know, I want to spend five hundred thousand dollars on this. Um, here you go, and here's five hundred thousand dollars. Come back with you know an awesome solution. <coughs> so look, okay, my budget is five hundred thousand, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you fifty thousand to to see what you can come up with, and then you know come back uh, after two weeks, whatever it is. Say okay, here's what we've built, fifty thousand, 
and then and then the business can then decide whether they want to continue funding that initiative or whether they want to, you know, they, they now decide well, you know what, the value isn't what we originally thought it was, or some other option is actually more valuable to us. So um, that's a really powerful way of, of, of getting to a, a good solution and spending as you know as least amount of money possible to get as, as good a solution as possible. Um, <clears throat> And what this allows for then is emergent value. So, and that could be positive or negative. So, we start working on, on an initiative. We don't really know. Like we can, have, we we sort of take a stab at what the value of that initiative is going to be, whether it be dollar dollar money or or you know um, stakeholder happiness, whatever it might be. We're sort of guessing that as well as the cost. And um, what we ignore if we if we just base uh, decisions on cost is this emergent value. So. We might start building this thing, and actually, um, negative emergent value occurs. So something happens in the market which makes this thing not as valuable as, as we wanted it to be. So we, it's really good to have the flexibility to then sort of ditch that initiative and, and move on to something else. Or similarly, you know, you could be building something, and it, you know, you go, "Hey guys, this is actually way, way more valuable than we thought it was going to be." So now you want to be able to have the opportunity to sort of perhaps, you know, even scale up. So you know, add another team to that. To, to work on that initiative, um, so working in this again in this iterative way, not just with with in terms of uh, you know the software development, but also in terms of the, the the way we fund these things, then it actually allows us to you know look at what's going on in, in the marketplace and um, and you know correct our course based on, on what happens and, and and keep our options open, um, but also work on multiple options as well. So. You know, if we just kind of choose one project over another and we say, right, well, we're going to work on this project for six months, um, you know, the other options that we've sort of rejected could actually t have turned out to be really, really valuable. And, we, and we've, you know, we've sort of uh, committed to this one project and we're not able to do anything about the other one. Whereas if we work in these small chunks, we can actually, um, we could actually run multiple experiments and say, okay, what we'll do is we'll work on this initiative for two weeks and this initiative for two weeks. And, and, and start learning about, about the domain and actually building up some knowledge and building a solution. And then, you know, we're going to learn so much just by, by doing that that we can actually then make a much more, uh, much better decision about what we continue working on. Whereas at the beginning of a project, we've got the least amount of knowledge possible about, about that thing. So why not let's get in there, let's do some small experiments and then, you know, decide which way we're going to go. Um, so, talking about constraints again, um, so obviously we, we want to embrace the uncertainty of software and the creativity around building solutions, but we also want, <coughs> well, stakeholders and investors want predictability around the fact that we're delivering stuff. So, um, this is where constraints are really powerful, because they reduce the variability of what we're doing and they limit the working pro our working progress. So, you know, to give you an example of a, of a pizza takeaway joint, um, they have some uh, sort of natural constraints around them. So, you know, the size of the premises, the number of chefs and delivery drivers they've got, the, the number of ovens and the size of ovens, um, and the delivery radius that they're going to deliver pizzas to. These are constraints that allow them to be be predictable. Um, now, obviously, software. Isn't like pizza in, in that it's it's not a sort of repeatable uh, process. You know, increments of software are, are all different. But this is where the power of um, making making our work as small as possible is really really beneficial because what it does is reduces that that variability and enables us to sort of um, use the the principles that a takeaway a pizza takeaway can use to, to get that sort of predictability about when things are going to get delivered. And it takes away that need to actually do deterministic estimates, where you actually ask people to say, you know, how long do you think this is going to take? Well, let's, me let's actually measure how long things take, and have constraints around what we're doing, which enable that predictability to actually happen. Because obviously, if there's too much work in progress, then you, you can't get that kind of predictability. You, you only get it by knowing, you know, a pizza joint knows how many pizzas it can get through in, in, in an hour, right? So um, it can use that throughput and then and it, and it knows how many pizzas it can fit in an oven, all these kind of things which allow it to actually make predictions about, you know, how long customers are gonna have to wait, you know, if they're the first person who phones up or if they're the tenth person who phones up. 
they can they can use this data to actually um, tell them when things are going to get done. It's not like they have to estimate how long each piece is going to take. Um, now, if the pizza joint is at capacity, so they're, they're making as many pizzas as they possibly can, if they try and make more pizzas, then it, the, the wait time for the customers is going to go up. And this is where um, uh, Little's Law comes into, comes into play. So um, this is a very simple formula where essentially the average wait time um, is, or in, the, in, the, in the context of a pizza joint, is the number of orders in progress divided by the average orders completed in an hour. So, so basically, uh, cycle time is uh, work in progress divided by your throughput. So in, in, the, in, in this case, now I've got no idea how many pizzas a pizza place makes in, a, in, a, in an hour, but I'm, let's assume it's 50. It's the, uh, I've no idea, but let's, let's go with that. Um, so using Little's Law, if we wanted to actually ensure that customers don't wait any more than half an hour, then what we can do is plug in half an hour into, into, into Little's Law, so we say 0.5 equals work in progress divided by 50, which is our throughput, and that gives us x equals 25. So that basically tells us that we should only take on 25 orders at a time. Um, and if we try and take on more than that, if we're at capacity, then the, the, the wait time is going to go up. If we're, if we're under capacity and we actually have the ability to deliver more uh, pizzas, then uh, we can, this, this value can stay constant, or it, or it can stay around, around the same. You know, we we may actually take on try taking on thirty orders and see how that affects our um, affects wait times. And if the wait time goes up, it suggests that we're actually at capacity and we should we should scale back down again. Um, so yeah, so if our work is thirty orders, the wait time goes up to thirty six minutes, um, assuming we're at capacity. Um, but like I said, if we if we can actually deliver sixty pieces per hour, then the wait time won't increase. So. These are these are really great. It's a really great formula to use, which um, obviously, like I say, it kind of makes an assumption that things are roughly the same size, which, as I mentioned before, is really difficult to do with software. But the way you can do it is to make things as simple and small as possible. Um, and then, even though we know that there is going to be variation around that, you know, some tasks are going to take five minutes, some tasks are going to take five days, even though you know the average is around two days. Well, that's fine because. Overall, on, on average, we can make predictions based on the number of things that go through, rather than having to look at individual items. So, you know, in the context of uh, story delivery, um, we can actually end up uh, using story count and cycle times rather than having to use story points. Um, so, as you can see here, you know, we've got a sort of classic uh, uh, Kanban board. Um, we've got a queue of stories and what we could actually do is, based on the cycle times, we can say, well, you know, if you're if you're at this point in the queue, then this is, you know, around the time you're going to be waiting. Um, and then, you know, obviously, lower down the queue you are, the, the longer the wait time is going to be. And this information is then really powerful because the product owner can then say, actually, this thing, I really, really want to make sure this thing gets done in the next couple of weeks, so I better move that up the, up to the top of the queue. So. You know, I still wouldn't advocate using this kind of data to make projections beyond a few weeks because it's still an estimate of sorts. Um, but it, it, what it help, helps us do is make is make decisions. So it actually helps us make trade-offs and what have you. Story point velocity is a bit tricky to do that with, you know, because you're sort of just looking at a number of points. As soon as you start sort of moving things around and um, reordering stuff, it's kind of then sort of tricky to sort of calculate, you know, how that affects when things are going to get done. Whereas you know, by having this nice simple model of uh, it's just the number of stories, then you can actually make um, it much simpler for the product owner, and it also gives us real empirical information rather than us having to sit down and go, oh, well, this is how big we think this is. Um, and one of the questions I put up here about uh, does backlog item size matter? Well, what I mean by that is, if we haven't actually made the commitment to, to build something, then does it actually matter that it's bigger? In an estimated term, than something than another thing. So, you know, if the product owner is saying, "Oh, oh you know, how, how long do we think this one's going to take?" Because I want to decide whether I should build this one or this one. Um, if if they haven't, actually, if, if we're not actually good at building that right now, if it's kind of lower down the backlog, it's got, you know, my, my question would be, well, um, why do you actually want to know that? Are you actually going to choose something because it's perceived as being cheaper? Um, 
in, in which case, is that really the right decision model to be basing our, our work on? Um, and if they're not doing that, if, if they're not actually going to make a decision, if they're not going to prioritise something because it's cheaper, then why do the estimate in the first place? The, the size becomes irrelevant, um, between, you know, choosing between two different things. If, if you're not going to make the decision based on, on cost anyway, then what, what's the point of knowing how big the thing is? It only becomes relevant when you actually say, oh, I want to build this thing, this is really valuable, and I want to know, you know how long it's going to take. And at this point, well, we can use this cycle time analysis to, to make an estimate of how long we think it's going to take. What we, don't need to, what we don't need to do is get the team to sit down and go, well, how long is this going to take? Um, I thought that was just a magical thing I just said. <laughs> um, now, um, so in order to be able to do this, um, we need to have, I believe, a consistent way of breaking down work rather than just breaking down a story and saying, right, we now think this is small. Because <coughs> the danger of that is, is, of course, that we're still making an estimate in, 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 that, in that sense. And, and we can be wrong. And, you know, um, and there's, of course, there's a whole sort of political connotations around getting estimates wrong and all this kind of stuff. So what I propose is, is actually using a slicing heurist, uh, heuristic. So I, an explicit policy for breaking up work so, as an example, a story must only have one acceptance test. Or it might be um, a story that we take on has a maximum of three tasks once we start splitting that work out. Whatever it is, it's something that is actually concrete and that you can follow for every single time you're actually committing to do, doing a piece of work. You split that uh, piece of work out in, uh, into separate stories until each of those stories meets the slicing heuristics policy. So at no point are you actually saying this thing is now, these are now small, um, or, or, or this one still, you know, still needs to be broken down because we think it's too, still too big. It's actually explicitly saying, you know, this is what you need to do before, before we're gonna take on this work. Um, so you can do this, for example, in sprint planning, if you're, you're doing an iterative uh, um, you know, XP scrum approach, or you could do it you know, just as you're about to pull it off, the, off your Kanban queue. Um, and it, it's something that could be added to, if you've got like a definition of ready for a story, it could be added to that. So it's, it's very explicit. And there's, the benefit of doing that, I believe, is that, well, first off, it, it explicitly promotes the good practice of splitting work. Now, we all sort of know that splitting work into smaller, simpler chunks is good, but we don't tend to actually put any, any rigor around that. We just kind of say, oh, this looks a bit big, so we're going to sort of break, break it down into smaller things. But and we might still end up with things that are um, still a bit, you know, still end up actually taking quite a long time to do. And that's fine because, you know, we just, like, like I say, it's, software is, work is variable. So we just do not know, however confident we are, how long things are going to take. You know, I, I'm all, I've always got developers uh, in, in my team going, ah, oh, yeah, that won't, that, won't, that won't take long. That'll only take half an hour. And I just sort of nod and go, okay, cool. I don't pay any credence to it because it's, 99% of the time, it's, it's way, way, way under what it's actually going to take. Um, similarly, I don't want to ask, you know, actually explicitly ask someone to, to how long it's going to take, but straight away, um, well, A, they don't know, and B, the sort of cognitive biases start kicking in. Um, you know, even things like, you know, there's particular types of work that you prefer working on you might actually subconsciously end up estimating that lower because you actually want to do that work. Um, whereas, you know, things that are sort of, you know, might be actually, the product owner really wants, it's going to be a really good thing for the customers, but yeah, it's, oh, it's all a bit, you know, it's all a bit hard because we've got to get into the legacy code base and, you know, change things we don't want to touch. So yeah, that's, oh, that's really big, that one. That's, you know, we can't do that. So I don't even, I don't even want to use that. I just want to, I want to measure how long things actually take and use good practices to split up the work, and then and then it's empirical, and we don't have to worry about all that nonsense and uh, talking about how long things are going to take. And it's easy to measure the effectiveness of your heuristic as well. Um, so an, an example might be the mean and median cycle time is within a, a very small percentage. So if you so um, if it, if all of you so you basically measure how long your, each of your stories actually takes, and you know you might find that most of them take. Um, three days, say. So, you know, which is quite good. You know, that's that's a, a, a quite small amount of time. But um, if the, the the overall average is 
quite significantly different because you've got these outliers that take like you know a month. Then you might want to adapt your heuristic because even you, even though your average is small, um, your median average is small, you're, you've still got the potential of having these massive outliers. So you might um, decide, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to inspect and adapt our heuristic and try and make it better so that we can actually bring those mean and median closer together so it becomes really quite predictable that you know things are going to take around three days and that's really really powerful once you, once you get to that point and you know if you're not doing that if you're just kind of kind of you know t-shirt size estimating or whatever then you know you don't really have a sort of uh, you know process that you can go through to go well, how do we get better at this and you end up sort of trying to get better at estimating rather than getting better at actually delivering the work in a predictable way That's it. Um, so, any uh, any questions? I'm sure, there must be some. Uh, do you, do you go, first off, do you guys uh, use story points or t-shirt sizing or? Yeah. Well, different teams. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, so we say no. So some so some teams are doing story points. We don't use story points. Yeah. 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 We use yeah. t-shirt sizes. Yeah. Yeah. Sort of thing. Mm. And when do you? At what point do you estimate uh, in t-shirt sizes? Just about when you're going to do the work, or at the beginning? Or? No, no, when they're when they're getting ready to be worked on. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So it's kind of yeah similar to this kind of approach. So it's the just-in-time planning thing, rather a little bit before just-in-time, yeah. but yeah, yeah, not not sort of yeah. So, so what do you do at the beginning of projects then, when uh, you know when it's kind of like, well, how long is this thing going to take? How big is this thing? What what? What do you guys do in that in that case? <laughs> Everyone guesses how many. <laughs> so for the rest of the so, we focus on yeah. smaller initiatives. Yeah, yeah. And we link everything back to the value proposition. Mm, mm. So it's always a question of value and what are you actually trying to do? So the question is not necessarily you may have a bunch of stories, cards, whatever you want to call yeah, it. Yeah. But it's always does this actually hit our value proposition? Mm. So it's always playing it. So you're focusing on value. Yeah. Value. Yeah. So we come up with uh, product canvases, which yeah. are essentially one pages, yeah. and in there you have your value proposition. Mm -hmm. You always use that as your anchor point. Yeah. And it's always the discussion: is this actually going to hit this? Yeah. So the question is always about the value, as opposed to oh, is this going to take two weeks? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And making sure that your projects, if you want to call them that, mm. are small as well. Yeah. Yeah. So we had a tendency to do six nine month projects, mm -hmm. but as you know, the danger with that is you just want to shove as much as you can yeah. into it, and yeah. people are like worried about it. And I think it also has to do with some of your architecture. Some mm -hmm. of the, some of our systems we can deploy daily. Mm -hmm. So now that you can deploy daily, you, really, you get rid of that mindset. Okay, cool, because we know that that train arrives very often, so we're not so much worried. Whereas exactly. other things that took like a month. It's yeah. kind of Exactly, so you're creating predictability by the practices that you do rather than making predictions, basically. It was yeah, essentially exactly what I'm talking about. But what I see happening time and time again is this kind of upfront you know, discussion of how long things are going to take, even with brand new teams, you know, in a brand new domain, and it's still like, yeah, yeah, I know, but can you tell us how long you think it's going to take? And, well, A, Obviously, it's kind of crazy because it's a brand new team. They've, they've never even looked at the code base and what have you. And B, again, we're just that it that we're building. Well, actually, we shouldn't really know what that is right now. It's it. We we, we want to know what the goal is and, and the sort of you know the problem we're solving. But if we actually know what the it is at the beginning, then there's it's not really uh, embracing a, a sort of iterative approach to development. Is you know and and this whole thing about welcoming change for you know the customer's competitive advantage. Well. You know, how can we do that unless we're actually willing to sort of throw away things and, and, and you know adapt and you know. Uh, so, well, that's good. so you guys don't typically do that um, kind of thing, or? It's for residential, so yeah. I don't know yeah. Other lines yeah. 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 Any other any other questions? Yeah. Say you've got something, you you know what you want to deliver. You even know what team you're going to start it off with. Mm. But you do you need it delivered by a particular day, so say mm. you know, it wouldn't have been exactly yeah. day. Yeah. How does someone decide whether to go ahead or not at the start, like if we go or not go? Well that's that's a great situation you're describing because you start off with a real constraint, which is awesome. So, you know, straight off the bat it's we know how long how long we have, which is really good. And you and you're talking about so giving it to a, a known team, so a team that you know has worked together and that and you sort of know what they can do. So in this instance, you can then use the data that you've got 
um, to help you make that initial decision. So I guess what I'm um, you know, mainly saying is a bad idea is, is to make an upfront decision where you're, when you actually don't have any data, you're, you're making a complete guess about, about what you're doing because you've got a brand new team and it's in a brand new domain. If it's a, 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 an existing team in a domain that I'm you know, already working in, you can actually say, well, you know, this is how many, you know, and, and assuming, you know, they have this kind of practice of, uh, of a slicing heuristic, etc. we sort of know, you know how many things they can get through, so that can kind of help influence your decision. Um, but, I, but I would still say that if you're making, if you're basing a go, no, go decision on, so you know that you, basically you know you've got to deliver something by a certain date, and you're, and you're saying, should we do this thing or not, basically? Because without sort yeah. of yeah. guessing and estimating, you don't yeah. know really how you the skills in that. Ah, well, we'll see. So, yeah, there we go. So if you've got a known team and you've got the known skills and what have you. You might need a bigger team, say, to complete it by the date. So. Right. Well, what I would say there is that how, like, how do you know that you need a bigger team? The first thing I would, well, the first thing I would do is actually say, well, let's let's actually do a small experiment and and see what you know, learn about the domain, see what's possible, see how we work together as a team. Um, you know, let's let's spend a month seeing what is possible, rather than just saying, you know, if if you, if you just base the go no go decision on, on just this kind of upfront guess, to me that you know I think that's a, a quite a big risk because. The value of what you're potentially going to produce could be, you know, beyond, you know, your wildest dreams. You just do not know. So, um, and it, you know, and that applies, at, you know, the backlog level as well. You know, if we sort of reject things based on their cost, you know, that one feature could have been the sort of golden killer feature, and, and we've sort of just gone, oh yeah, that one will take too long, so we won't do it. And you know, this is why. We've got to work in these small experimental ways so that we can actually really, really, you know, learn enough information to actually make these decisions. You know, if we feel at the beginning we don't have enough information, then we need to get that information rather than just make a guess about what, what can be done. But like I say, you're in a good situation if you've got fixed teams, you know, and you know what kind of they, they can output and what have you. It makes it your job a lot easier because then you can actually, you know, look at the data. And this is what why I'm sort of saying that in order to be able to work in this way, you kind of need these kind of practices to happen so that you, you can have that predictability. Um, but yeah, typically, unfortunately, uh, companies tend to just kind of fly by the seat of their pants and just, you know, they approve a business case and then like, you know, maybe six months later or even a year later, they decide, right, we're now going to put a team together to do this. And it was based on the you know the original amount that was allocated was based on a complete wild guess of, of you know how long things are going to take and what kind of team you're going to need to put in place, and then you sort of you're, so now in terms of the actual team that's now taking on that work, that is their constraint now, so they have that that amount of money. So you know now what I do with teams, even if I'm in a company that will ask me to make this upfront estimate, you know I won't just say no, we're not going to do that, right? We'll we'll, we'll do it, but I'll just completely ignore it and I won't ask my team to do any more estimating as we go along. What I will do is actually measure what we're really doing and I'll use the actual cons real constraint which is how much money we've got. I don't care about how long we said things are going to take, let's work around that constraint and then let's split that constraint into s small con smaller mini constraints that we can actually learn from and iterate over. So, so that, that would be my approach there. We're actually a bit of an interesting case where we've yeah. got a project a bit like that at the moment. <coughs> Some of you guys might know Business IQ. Uh, we're looking at doing a CRM implementation for the media developers <coughs> in the context with these guys. And exactly that question comes mm. up there, yeah. so how big a team should we have? Yeah. What kind of solution? How long are we going to talk to the, yeah. the senior manager about our time frame? So yeah. effectively we've taken a, a risk management approach to yeah. that. Yeah. And the question there is what are we actually worried about? Yeah. What are, where, where are the ways that we could go wrong in terms of delivering something here? Exactly right, it's actually yeah. an interesting exercise because it actually turns out that the technical stuff is, is by and large not an issue. It's yes, right. for other concerns. It's but usually a very small a, part of the <coughs> overall picture. Yeah. yeah, and in terms of the approach to the team size, we started with a very small team. We we're just slowly ramping up until yeah. we feel comfortable that that's going to give us the right throughput. See, that's, and that's, and that's, and that's uh, exactly. I didn't, I didn't mention service risk management, but that's exactly what this is all about. It's start, so having having small fixed teams that are able to deliver things, uh, you know, as a team. 
but then if you do need to scale up this initiative because you know you know what's bigger than we you know this is something big that requires more than just one team on it will you just put another team on it as well rather than go well let's try and guess how many people we need to do this thing because the problem is of course scaling up um, people in a team does, is, is not effective at all uh, you know you get the, the diminishing returns of uh, you know of how much can actually be output and it, and it, to, to the point where it's actually you know a team of like, three people could probably <coughs> deliver more than a team of you know ten people over the same time frame because because of all the scaling up of all the communication issues and everything else that comes with a big team um, so that uh, that is exactly the kind of approach I, I'm talking about here having having known small teams if you do find something that's really really valuable then that that's a great problem to have and then you can you can add more teams to that initiative and, and you know depending on how many teams you've got you can drop off other lower value initiatives and they can you know pivot onto whatever they need to work on to sort of deliver the value for the company. But then it becomes a conscious conversation. Yeah. The value of one thing versus value of another. Exactly right. Exactly right. Exactly. 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 I thought there was another interesting point you made there mm. around uh, the classic corporate mistake of, of pulling teams apart. Yes. Yeah. I've seen that many, many times. Mm. Oh, it happens everywhere. Yeah, everywhere. Having a few yeah. tears over a beer yeah. <laughs> when you think about the, what, what's been lost. I mean, it's tragic in some cases. Well, it's the classic project mindset. <laughs> I think, it, again, it all stems from this kind of start and end date thing. But software just doesn't have a start and end date. You know, it's but I think that, like, there, there, is a, there is another aspect to that, which mm. is in the companies where they, they do start to preserve teams, and mm. I've seen that as well, yeah. you come to the other end of the extreme, which is the teams become static. Yeah. So the problem you face then is, so how do you keep those teams fresh? Yeah. And once again, uh, the answer we've got within, within the Business IQ program anyway mm. is a conscious policy of rotation of people through the, yeah. the different initiatives that are going on, yeah. which has a cost, yeah. but the truth is that no team is forever, no matter what you do. No, no, that's right. So you need to do something. That's right. And, um, and I think, like I mentioned before, the sort of having that sort of technical leadership as well across the company and, you know, and, and that sort of product leadership as well to make sure that, that there is alignment Around you know the, the way we're doing things and what and the goals we're trying to achieve, like you want the teams to have autonomy over their process, but at the same time you want to make sure that everyone's you know working towards the same goals and you know um, has the same kind of a, a, approaches you know that are going to create this predictability and effectiveness like, like I'm talking about. So um, yeah, I'd like, you know love to see more companies doing that, and obviously it's easier when you start you know you start a small company or whatever. It's easy to sort of start like that, but you know when you're talking about existing companies and talking about agile adoptions and what have you, and you know it's really difficult for them to come up with a model that allows them to really be you know agile with a small a and, and sort of be able to be proactive in their in their market and react to react to their competitors and what have you. So um, yeah, it's an ongoing ongoing challenge, but um, hopefully people start thinking more and more about this. It's certainly like this whole topic has, has been very uh, you know, it's touched a lot of people's nerves, um, and uh, this is why I keep getting asked to do these kind of talks and have you on it because, you know, it's obviously controversial, and um, you know, there's uh, a lot of people just saying it's nonsense and what have you. But you know, from my personal experience and, and talking to other people around the world who are actually working this way, and you guys are doing the same thing. You're you're not estimating, you're measuring things, and you're, you know, you're pivoting, and and, and you know, you're thinking about value and thinking about. What matters rather than you know the questions that get over you know I go to the steering committee and all you hear is are we on are we on track to deliver this scope so are we even going to talk about what we're actually building you know and the value that we've delivered you know in the last month and but it's all just about yeah yeah but are we on track and you know it's about this, providing that cadence yeah the yeah. yeah. uh, organisation confidence that yeah. you know, we're delivering at this rate mm. that's fine. Mm. And it's having that, and that's based on actual fact. This is what yeah. we're doing for the last yeah. 18 months, as opposed to what we think we can sort of mm. deliver at this rate. They're, they're really different. That's right. So that's right. it's kind of important to establish that cadence. And then once yeah. you get the confidence and the trust, it's okay. Mm. And they know the train regularly goes and yeah. the features are regularly delivered and the value right. is obtained. Yeah. But it's a, it's a journey to get there, though. That's right. And the other thing, like, you know, going back to the pizza example, is that you know, it becomes very obvious for a pizza restaurant when they've, they're taking on too much. But software, because it's kind of you know it's it's not tangible. You could just you know you could just take on almost an infinite amount of work, and you just wouldn't know that you've taken on too much unless you actually start measuring your capacity in this way. So actually, you know, saying how many things can we actually get through 
at a sustainable pace, um, and then that's actually going to dictate you know how many projects we have and how many things we're working on. But we tend to just go right here are all the things we need to do, and we just have to sort of you know spread ourselves thinly and try and do all of these things. And of course, you don't get that predictability, and then stakeholders get frustrated. And they say you need to give better estimates. Why are your estimates crap? And so then people start multiplying their estimates by three and, and what have you. And it's just this you know perpetual dysfunction. Um, so it's a real cultural thing, and it all stems from this original my upfront mindset of, of trying to you know figure out exactly what we're doing and when is it going to be done by. So yeah, it's it's certainly not easy to by any stretch of the imagination to, to do this, but. You know, what I say to teams who are still doing story point estimates and what have you is that you don't actually have to change anything you're doing to start actually doing this. So you can actually start measuring cycle times, splitting work up. You know, it's not like you, you have to say, oh, we're not doing story points anymore. You know, one, one, of my, one of the early reasons I came to this way of thinking was that I started measuring both. I started, you know, looking at story count and story points to, to see, you know, if the data backed up. You know, using story points, and and because I've read articles of people saying that you know story points are harmful and you don't need to use them, and but I was kind of a bit skeptical. But you know, so well, if you're skeptical about something, go in there and try it and experiment, and then learn for yourself whether it's actually you know there's something in it. And um, and I found that <coughs> story count is even when you look at a sort of six month prediction, it's it's better than using story points. I still don't advocate doing it, but you know working in projects where we were working off a pretty much fixed backlog and what have you, story count was a much better predictor of uh, delivery date than story points were. Um, and then of course you also get rid of all the dysfunction of having to, people have to estimate things. Um, and you know, management measuring velocity and making it a target rather than you know, using it as, as a planning tool. Um, so yeah, I, this is the way I work now and I, you know, I I don't ask the team to estimate at all. We just, I, but what I do ask is that we split stuff down small in this kind of way, measure what happens, and uh, just inspect and adapt our process like any other agile team would, and uh, you know, and keep on track with, with what, what we're trying to build and build up. You know, as we as you go along, you build up the confidence of what you're building. The solution becomes more apparent, and then you and then you can start saying, oh well, you know, here is the. Here are the things that you know you said you wanted to deli deliver. You know you might want to sort of take a few of these out if you if you definitely want to release on this date and you know, these kind of things. And obviously, if you're continuously delivering, then the whole release thing goes away as well because this whole concept of release dates. You know, if you're actually just continuously delivering features, then you you know it, that, that conversation goes away. So uh, yeah. <laughs> one, last, oh. one last question, maybe. Yeah. Cool. The, the other thing um, is that I think sometimes the story points can actually constrain how much you do. I was working on a team a while back now and we just found that our story points and, and our velocity yep. was really, really accurate. Yes. <laughs> yep. And it's like, you know, this is actually the first time we've ever done yep. agile kind yep. of work. Yep. And it's like, this is amazing. How are we, how are we so good at estimating? Yep. So a few of us had the feeling that what was actually happening is that, oh shit, we haven't done enough points this week, yeah. let's, let's bell it out. Yeah. And then if you're already ahead, you're like, oh yeah, you'll just get distracted. And yeah, yeah, whatever. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what, 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 just as a, a, just a quick, quick, a quick one, what do you mean by you found that it was really accurate? Well, well we, we had, a, we had our, our burn-up chart yeah. and we, had, we were scoring points on all our cards yeah. and we found that our predicted velocity was very close to our actual velocity. Right, so we were doing the same, the, the predicted number of points. Also per sprint, so, so in, in sprint planning, you, yeah, you, yeah. You, oh, okay, I see what you're yeah. So okay. the, the, yeah. the lines stuck together really closely, yeah. and it's like, and because we were actually pretty new at the game, we yeah. thought this is yeah. pretty unlikely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no, and, 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 and that happens, and yeah. uh, you know, and, and an, another pattern you see is the teams that do use story points after sort of seven or eight sprints. They're sort of they're doing all their planning poker. And everything, oh yeah, that's a three, yeah, it's a three, that's a three, that's a three. And you start kind of saying, well, you know, if everything's a three, why are we even bothering estimating yeah. them? And then you start looking at your story count velocity over your story point velocity and realise there's actually a much smaller variance on the, on the story count, um, or, it might, or, or it's just the same. And so then you kind of go, well, what's the point of using story points rather than, you know, you know actually having to sort of make a conscious decision to not use them? So, 
like I say, they're all things you can use in conjunction and different things you can try. And um, yeah, you guys, I know you you already got that kind of mindset of experimenting and doing cool things anyway. So um, yeah, thank you very much for your time. Cool. Thank you. Or take one of these sheets, and you could just give us a bit of feedback on the session. That would be cool. Okay, and thanks again for coming. No worries. <laughs> Thank you. We'll take away with you.